Well, good evening, and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, and our program tonight is we're having a return guest. We'll do this occasionally. And uh, Marie Joseph was on the program how many years ago? Six years ago. Six years ago. And she is a revert. She's also the executive director of the Legacy of Life Foundation. She's got a website, life, legacyoflifefoundation.org. I'm sure we'll talk about that. She's an author and a speaker. Uh, welcome, Marie, back to the Thank program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's good to, good to uh, be here. One of the things I like, to, we'll get to it later, but one of the things mm -hmm. I like to talk about when I have a returning guest is you've been a Catholic for 18 years or so, and so part of it is, uh, it's one thing to talk about what brought us into the church, which I'm going to ask you to do again, but then after a number of years, we start looking back and see other ways that the Lord opened our heart long before we realized mm -hmm. that he was working our life. Maybe we can talk about that later. But first, right. let me back away mm -hmm. and give the audience a little summary of your journey, if you would. Sure. So I was raised in a Catholic household, so cradle Catholic. Yeah. My father was from Sicily, Italy. My mother, Puerto Rico, and they met in New York. <laughs> and they didn't really know their faith that well. So it was... 1965 when I was born and there was a lot of confusion at that time you know Vatican II documents had just come out and things were changing it was a little confusing and I believe some of the catechism catechesis had not really taken root in the hearts my parents didn't know their faith that well so yeah. we were raised but after confirmation that was graduation from the faith yeah. and so we, we stopped practicing and, uh, yeah, right so yeah. without knowing stop practicing it was really an exercise we just got out of, we did something else on Sunday, went to the museum, went out to a restaurant. And so slowly, so I just started living a life that had nothing, no God in it at all. And as I probably up, said this the first time you were on the program, I, uh, but when I, I think about your New York City, 60s, 70s, <laughs> Italian, uh, Puerto Rican, that sounds like West Side Story to me. That's right, that's right, tonight's <laughs> the night, that's right. I mean, that, that was your culture, right? That was it, that was wow. actually it. And so, very passionate people, lively, a lot of love and, you know, a lot of great stuff going on, good food, right. but, but the faith wasn't really there. Yeah. So, uh, so I was really raised, especially as a woman, to be, go out there and make something of yourself. Go out there and get a degree, and get a job and my mother hadn't been to college so you know, get a job get an education and then never stay home and think about marriage and children a lot later so I went to Cornell University I got a business and communications degree and a Spanish minor might as well right <laughs> and uh, and I graduated and I met my husband there and, uh, and life was great. We had a girl, we had a boy, we were living the dream, we were both making good money. And there were times in raising the children, especially when I had the children, where I was thinking, I wonder if I should get a hold of that faith thing. I should probably learn that faith thing. Where do you go get, where do you go buy some of that stuff? <laughs> you know, and I really didn't, there was nobody in my life who was, was, who was Catholic or even Christian who talked about Jesus. It was almost like you saw it and you thought it was a nice story. So really it just wasn't existent at all in my life. And then and my your husband didn't bring any faith. No, into no, and he was either. he was Catholic, but he hadn't been going to church yeah, either. Okay. So the two of us were happy. We'd go once in a while. We felt like being good people. Isn't that what good people do? They get up on Sunday when they have nothing else to do, and they go to church and go to brunch and make it an event. And that's all. That's all I really did. And then one day I my, I found out. You know, so I had the second child. Things got a little bit rockier trying to manage. Uh, family life and, and my husband and my jobs and it got really difficult and then I was really hit with a divorce mm -hmm. with him coming home and saying uh, I, I actually I thought it was another woman and I was ready to say you know maybe you need to go find yourself and and and, and I as, even though I wasn't a pra living my Catholic faith yeah. I just knew two things one is that you, know, you don't get divorced and and homosexuality isn't something that we embrace. Well, oh my goodness, he's going to be homosexual, and wow. um, and so he's leaving. And so my children were one and three at the time, and so I immediately was thrown into being a single mother, 
and then uh, at the time I had I had stayed home with the children and now I was going to have to figure out what I was going to do next. Hmm. So I went through a lot of pain and suffering and without faith and there was a moment where I said, yeah, I wish I would have somehow gotten that faith thing I was thinking about. <laughs> and I decided to go speak to a priest. And I went to the church and I just didn't have a great experience and God bless the poor priest, but I, I, I was a live one that walked into the <laughs> office that night because I went there on a Saturday night and I said, um, you know, I am going to be divorced. I have a homosexual husband and I want to know how I fit into this Catholic club because I have two strikes against me, so I'm out, right? What do I do, what do I do? And I was looking for a program, I was looking for something, and he really was just saying, well, how about you start by going to Mass on Sunday? And I said, well, what's that gonna do for me? <laughs> and so I just didn't feel, I didn't, I went the next day, I had two crying children, I was crying, we, you know, we didn't really fit in. And so I left there angry. And that's when I can really point to the moment where I said, I'm leaving huh. the church that I'm not even going to, I'm leaving now. Hmm. And uh, with anger in my heart, and it was almost like the pain of what I was going through. I was putting that on what I thought were the teachings of the church. Yeah. You know, I was now a sinner and I wasn't welcome. Yeah. And no one said that to me. Yeah. So I left there again without the correct theology, without the correct teachings. But the many teachings that I know people right now have those thoughts in their yeah. mind that if their life doesn't fit in with the teachings of the church, they're an outcast. And so very hurt, I joined the gym instead. And I, you know, and I started living a very sinful lifestyle. I started gravitating towards nightclubs and places where, you know, people were encouraging me, get back on that horse again, get out there. The priest had said, you know, you, you, you can't get married again, you know? And I said, well, I don't understand that. What, what do you mean I can't get married again? And so I left angry yeah. and uh, I was out there trying to find happiness and trying to find joy. Uh, and it was getting me more and more depressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in that journey of heading downward, spiraling downward, I, uh, I got to that point that many people do where you just want to end your life. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, I, um, I then had an experience where I called out to God. And, um, and my grandfather had just died and it made me think about heaven and I wonder where he is. And then I um, said, is this all you have for me, Lord? I mean, I didn't say Lord, I didn't know him. I said, you, whoever you are out there, you're God and you made creation out there and you made me too. Why is it so beautiful out there? And why does it feel so disgusting in here? That's how I felt. I felt disgusting. I felt, I felt um, not worthy. I just felt like my life had no purpose. It had no matter. It just, uh, I felt like I was kicked to the curb and I just, felt uh, rejected by society. The life I was living was, was creating that vacuum for me uh, with two little children, trying to be a mother, working uh, three different jobs and trying to make it all happen and then trying to have a social life, which was actually a destructive life. Hmm. And um, so I, when I, I heard, uh, I had a feeling that the answer was no to that question, what well, is this all you have for me? Because I'm done, I'm done if you do. Hmm. And um, I went to sleep, I woke up the next morning, and I heard, go to church. And I said, go to church? The Catholic <laughs> church? Because another thing, Marcus, that had happened at the time in this life of single motherhood, of partying and of you know going places with two children, you start meeting other single mothers yeah. and other people who've also been divorced and other people that are living lives where they're broken. And, uh, and feeling pain, but masking that pain. I had met a lot of women who had belonged to different churches. And so I, you know, someone said, well, join the Church of God over here. They come and they, there's great community there and they help you with your home and they, they help fix up your house. And my house was kind of falling apart because I was falling apart. And they said, you know, or come to this event here, they, they help women that are single with children. And I didn't feel like that existed in the Catholic church. Yeah. And so I was, there were many times when I was gonna join another church because of the community. Yeah. Uh, so when I, when I got that feeling, go back to, it's seven in the morning on a Tuesday morning, go to church. 
who hangs out at the Catholic <laughs> Church at 7 in the morning? So I said, okay, I guess I'll go. And I was definitely dressed inappropriately. I mean, I had tank top and short shorts. And I walked into the church, and I saw, and I saw Mass was going to start. And I said, okay, I guess I'll stay. And in that Mass, in that moment, that's where I prayed from the first time from my heart to a God that I used to just say, oh God, I never prayed before. I finally said, oh God, please help me. Help me to, uh, to make a change, to leave here different. And, and that day I heard the gospel proclaimed from the altar. I heard the word, I heard hope and peace come out of whatever the words he said and the gospel proclaimed. And then I also, there was something about the Eucharist when the priest raised the host. There was something about that Eucharist that I knew something was real. When I left that day, I didn't realize that when you're depressed and when you're really down in, in that kind of a time for that long, you start to look down. You start to, you don't notice the beauty in life, in creation. I left that day with new eyes. I left that day seeing beauty and seeing a sky that I'd never seen before and sun and, and greenery and, and just everything was just wonderful. And if somebody cut me off on the road, I said, oh, God bless you. I can pray for you instead of, you know, getting angry. And, uh, and my whole life started to change at that, at that moment. I was thinking that you, you may have seen your, your children through different eyes too. One of the first, I'm so glad you said that, one of the first things that happened was, and it's for so many people, when you feel like you got saved, all of a sudden you're just, you're just, you're not the same person. And I started saying, well, who's Jesus? Does any, do you know Jesus? Because <laughs> uh, I don't know anything about Jesus that people would say, are you going to be a Jesus freak? I said, well, I can't be a freak if I don't know who he is. <laughs> but I kept thinking, oh, well, he, he saved me. I was lost and now I'm found. So he probably has something huge for me to do. I mean, big, big, give me something. He has something big for me. So, so I I went to, uh, and I didn't know anything about adoration. Somebody said there's an adoration chapel where you could sit before the, the Eucharist and you could pray before our Lord. And so, I, you know, I went in there. And people were teaching me different things, and uh, and I was in there and I said, Oh Lord, what do you what do you want me to do? You have something big for me. And it's probably one of the clearest I've ever heard the Lord speak to me. And He said, Be a mom. <laughs> Be a mom. I said, be a mom. That's that's what you want me to be. <laughs> Again, somebody, in, you know, I had a big job in corporate America. Being a mother was was just something on the side, right, or something. But you know, be a mom. So from that moment on, I made my motherhood be my 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 Ivy League career was being a mom. And it wasn't do the job of a mom. It was be a mom at the level of being. And that took me on a journey of, I mean, bringing the faith, bringing my children to mass having a schedule for my children now. There was no order in my house, having a schedule. Oh, they love that. And uh, <laughs> praying with them on a regular basis. And I decided to make the faith fun. So what I did was I would, I, oh, it's a feast day. Well, we should have that a big dinner with a big ice cream cake or some big dessert. And then I found that every single day I was having the big dessert because there's a feast day <laughs> almost all the time. So we were always celebrating. So there was always celebrations in my house then. They would come home if it was a merry feast day. I remember one time I got balloons and they were all and they would they came in and every Hail Mary they would pull the balloons so they walked into a house of balloons <laughs> confession the sacraments were alive confession on Saturdays they'd be playing ball you know my, my neighborhood was awesome and everybody would be playing baseball all the kids on on the, on the weekends and I would pull out with my minivan and I would go confession <laughs> and then all the kids would come running because they would know that my kids had to jump in the car every Saturday we were going to confession but they all wanted to go so we all went to confession <laughs> and the kids who were not Catholic said well how do I become Catholic I want to be Catholic <laughs> they actually went to see the priest he said are you sending people over to me that are underage I said yes absolutely <laughs> but after confession we had to celebrate that we were cleaned so I took everyone to ice cream so it was just so much fun to be Catholic okay. and uh, and that's how that's that's what really changed that I brought the sacraments into my house by making us live the faith we started having dinner every night around the table instead of on the fly right so every night was dinner to this day every night is dinner and so there were things that I that I just received just from the sacraments of being in the church that was amazing uh, the community I was missing 
there was an evangelization program pretty soon after when I started going around Who's Jesus? And there was, it was called the Alpha Program. That's in many of the Christian yep. churches and the Catholics were adapting it. And I joined that and that was community building. And that's where I started to see the community in the church. All right, our guest is Marie Joseph. When I, okay, now when I hear your story, <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I, as I listen to the stories in Journey Home week after week after week, week I, I, I always find myself stepping back and, and amazed by the, the different ways that God uses grace to touch people's lives. And sometimes we think, oh, that, that person was so smart, it was the intellect that convinced them of the church. But even in any of these cases, we see the work of God's mercy and grace in somebody. And in your case, it, it almost seems like, it, it, you talk about it, as you look back, was he, did, was he letting you get to the bottom of the barrel? Was that what was needed for you so that grace could awaken you to the beauty of his? Because to a certain extent, what you learned, you had had to a certain extent all along about the faith, but for some reason now all of a sudden you see it. That's grace. So did he need for you, given what you had, did he need to let you get all the way down before he could bring you up again? Absolutely. Perfect, perfect description. And I believe, I think of the word mercy for sure. And I think of the word experience, experience. And I feel that every, God works in each of us differently depending right. on our own personality. So he knows with me, a make it happen kind of gal, <laughs> that, that if I had to really know that I had tried it my way too many times, like the song, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and everything had always gone my way my whole life. So the only way I would really have known that I was lost and now found was to get that, that, that feeling of pain and destruction and, and death to be now a feeling of joy and that well, like the woman at the well, welling up inside of me. Well, I didn't buy that. I didn't do anything to earn it. Uh, it wasn't my Ivy League education. You know, so it was so exactly. And I feel that for me, and everybody's different, it was the experience that I believe God intended there to be at this, during the, in the sacraments. Yeah. The experience of his mercy and confession, I had an incredible, when I went into confession, I went in with a long list. God, God bless the priests, <laughs> these, these wonderful priests that had to deal with me. But I had a long list of all, you know, there were different men in there, you know, Bill, Bob, Harry, I had to go through all of them. And he said, no, no, you don't have to do that mess. And I said, oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. And when I got through the list, I felt this incredible joy, this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. And I was experiencing Christ in the sacraments before I knew anything about the faith. And then I said, okay, now I want to learn the faith because, and this evangelization program was number one. It was, who is Jesus? How do you pray? Who is the Holy Spirit? It was just such elementary things that we need to encounter Jesus in a personal way. Then it was, okay, now let's learn Let's learn the faith and the history of the faith, which I then went to St. Charles. I, I, I became, and to your point too, I was baptized Catholic. I went to, I went to public school, but then I went to all girls Catholic high school. Yeah. So there so I don't know what happened there, right? Yeah. But that happens for so many people. We're closed and we don't hear, we don't hear. So I didn't know the faith, but then I became one after being, I went and became a Catholic school teacher. My children were small. They were now in school. And then I went at night to St. Charles Borromeo seminary oh. to get my master's in theology. So I would really know the faith. And that was an amazing experience. Um, sometimes for, uh, this isn't true of all fallen away Catholics, but sometimes when they're brought up in the church and they get information, but it doesn't, as, as, as some say, it doesn't go from the head to the heart, you know, it doesn't bring that conversion about. But one of the things that becomes a barrier can be devotions. Because as a, a young Catholic, you see the statues and, mm -hmm. and the different actions and the beads and stuff. So that when you leave the church coming back, what do I do with this stuff now? Was that authentic mm -hmm. Catholicism or do I relearn it 
fresh mm -hmm. to get its meaning. Was that a part of your journey? So right, my journey was that I needed a lot of healing. I needed to be set free of a lot of things. I needed forgiveness and mercy. So my experience was first with Jesus. Yeah. Then it moved into God the Father. And God bless my, my wonderful Italian father. But there were definitely issues with that relationship, right? <laughs> the the, the father-daughter relationship. And so I so experiencing the love of the father, and that helped me in my relationship with my own father. Uh, and so, but that was experiencing that for the first time. And then as life went on, all of a sudden I started going, so what is this with Mary? What's this thing with Mary? Because, you know, I just go straight to Jesus. So I could have been just any other, um, you know, Christian out there who's saying, you know, I don't, I don't really buy this thing with Mary. I don't, I don't get that. I'm going right to Jesus. And I had a really good relationship with my mother, but, but I just didn't know how that was necessary. Right. And then in God's, in God's divine mercy, I was able to then um, experience, actually with Scott Hahn's book, oh. the book about Mary. Yeah. Um, I forgot what it's called right now, but anyway, it was a great book. And when I read through that, and so that really brought out the scriptural references to Mary and also the teachings of the church. And that um, said, claim Mary as your mother, I did. And that was the end of that. I had some great women in the church that taught me how to pray the rosary and that's it became the, the really a foundation of my household yeah his book is hail holy queen mm -hmm. and it's a very wonderful book and because he besides coming at it with a very uh, as a very sound catholic theologian he he also because of his past outside the church knows the barriers that people have so he does a great job of, of addressing that issue which again in your case brought up catholic uh, you may have had bad examples of mm -hmm. devotion to Mary, and so I didn't get th through all that. Um, you, you very quickly, I think, after becoming a Catholic, got involved in pro-life stuff. Is that mm -hmm. right? Talk about how that all, and why, how did that start? Right. So, well, first thing, when I came back to the Catholic Church, again, I kept thinking, God, something big for me. But then also, now I have to serve. So as many people also do try to kind of overdo it by yeah. going into, <laughs> you know, join the choir. I can sing, join the choir. I can do this, do this, you know, so do everything. And, and I saw that there was uh, praying in front of an abortion clinic, and I saw a pro-life club, and I said, oh, i got to be in that. i got to join. So uh, I went to pray with my children in front of the abortion clinics, and that's what we're doing, wow. March to Life, March for Life. Yeah. And I had little children. It was great to to teach them about the value of life, and but that's really all that I thought that there was to even do for the pro life movement. It was uh, quickly after I graduated from the seminary that I was praying what God wanted me to do next, and uh, and we can talk about it. I went through a year once again where He wasn't going to just show me right away. I had to make sure that I had a year where I was running out of everything, including money, <laughs> and. and waiting and speaking and doing and I was teaching I was an adjunct professor at St. Charles in theology theology professor and my passion really was to bring people to Christ and to teach the faith so I wanted to teach and and jobs where I would have a job and not get the job and it was just going on and on um, and then all of a sudden I got a phone call saying this might be off your radar but how would you like to be the executive director of a brand new crisis pregnancy center that we just got started? It's just a project, but we need somebody like you. And I said, well, that is definitely off my radar because <laughs> I was doing the other things, but that was kind of all I was, you know, really doing. And this was really going on the front lines. This was, mm. this was running a, a center and really trying to develop it from the ground up. And they had gotten started and they saw that they were saving some lives and they wanted somebody with business experience with theology experience, uh, and then also with a passion for the faith. Yeah, yeah. so you jumped into that with both feet. I jumped feet, into huh? that with both feet and started. Uh, it was the woman who had been there had left. We, were st we needed to make it a 501c3, and uh, I started doing the counseling. I started getting, and it was me, myself, and I recruited volunteers. I was really living and breathing it. and. Uh, and we started to see that you could take the principles of some of the gifts and skills God's given us in business and um, communications, and we can put that into a ministry. 
Oh. And God will use it if it's if there's order there. And pretty soon we started saving 25 lives, then 75 lives, then 100 lives. And now um, after these last six years, because when I was here, I had just started that. Oh. And uh, and now it's been 1,645 lives that would have been aborted or alive today. Oh. And more importantly, women who are finding, who have found love and mercy and are transforming their lives. Yeah. we're. Uh, let's see, I'm going to still pause on the break coming up because I want to ask you another question. Because often there's a debate amongst Christians about what's, what, what are we to do? And there are those that really see our goal as Christians now is to evangelize, um, to share the faith. Uh, we're, we're called to abide in Christ and produce fruit. Well, the fruit are new Christians. Mm -hmm. So there's that, that side of it. But there's another side that looks at it, no, we, we are to love, we are to care, we are, we are to feed the poor, uh, we're, we're to clothe the, the naked, we're to take care, that's what we're called to do. And so sometimes these two groups can seem like enemies, mm -hmm. can be kind of against each other, you know, no, nah, we're not supposed, we're supposed to evangelize. And but the truth is, no, they're together, it's, mm -hmm. it's hand and glove. Mm -hmm. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about how the work of of, of saving these lives indeed leads to evangelization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and, and this really is our, it fits with our theology, is that right. we meet them with mercy and love and no judgment, the same way that Christ meets every sinner. And that's hard for people sometimes. I, I, could, I see it, and it's because if you're so Catholic and you believe and, and that's a sin, well, you have to enter into that sin. So we enter into this sin where we really, just as Mother Teresa used to say, just empty ourselves of our own, of our own self, of everything that we, I mean, we don't leave our beliefs, but we, we're present for them yeah. so that they don't, the reflection that we're giving them by listening is no judgment, mercy, love, kindness, compassion. And we, we journey with them there in the decision process. And then we advocate, and that's where we give them the help that they need. And then they, they deliver and they're going to this, we have this three year super mother program, it's called the STAR program. They become superstar mothers. And in that program, we're developing relationship and now they're starting to trust and, and we're becoming family, okay? And then in those years, in that process of delivering this new baby, they're saying, wow, motherhood's an amazing gift. Who are you people anyway? You people are crazy nice, crazy love. This is insane. My own family's like this. Now you're my family. And then now, once you start feeling better because your needs are met, your material, your physical needs are met, now the spirit comes. And they start saying, I would like a Bible study. I would like to know. Mm -hmm. So now what happens in our three-year program is that most of the people coming for abortions are writing down about 80% right Christian or Catholic. They write it wow. down. Uh, and now when we go to start, to, when we do Bible study with them, we're finding they all say, I want to know who Jesus is. I want to know how to pray. <laughs> I want to know who the Holy Spirit is. I don't know the Bible. I want to know the Bible. And I get that reflection to where I was. So what's the difference between they and them and myself? It's just that it's, we're just at different places. But, but, but now the spirit comes and now they're ready and now they want to know. And, and that many of them, many, many hundreds have been away from their churches, all different denominations yeah. because they felt judged and, uh, and they're hurt. And so that's where I feel like we're really getting to the evangelization. It's on, it's on the back end. It's on the end where they're transforming because because now they're having experiences of of love and mercy. So it, it's a process, a time. What comes first and second? Mm -hmm. It isn't one against the other. And the danger is, as uh, you know, we can evangelize them, but they have needs too, mm -hmm. or we can we can take care of their needs, but they need to know the source of that life, they need to know Jesus. But there's a, there's a timing, and you deal with what's up front. And, and uh, you know, people are, are hurting and poor and naked. Well, we gotta deal with those issues first before they can hear us. Exactly. And that was Mother Teresa all, all the way right. through. And creating that place and space so that somebody can encounter and have experiences with with other people, you know, and that's that's the thing. When people see a sign, I know a woman came to the center and she's she was gonna have an abortion and she saw a sign that said, you know, Jesus loves you and people were yelling that to her. And she said, I don't even know who he is. 
you know, or, or we love your baby. And, um, and so sometimes when people uh, try to evangelize at that moment of crisis, they're not ready to hear. Yeah. And so, so to have ears that can hear, we first have to meet them with love and mercy and compassion. And that's, that's really what our, our mission is to do, is to, to, to build a relationship and help, help build yeah. that trust through all the support and the love they receive. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've said this before on the program, but I remember hearing Fulton Sheen talk about Mother Teresa, and he related a story about one time Mother Teresa was speaking to a group of priests, and one of the priests at the question and answer time stood up and said, Mother Teresa, I don't understand how you can, you can get down there with those dirty, filthy people. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. They're so repulsive. How can you do that? And she said, I didn't know they were that way. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they were, all I mm -hmm. saw was Jesus. You know, <laughs> I know, I know, and you know, it's, I, I just love reading her readings and it just gives my staff and I so much strength and courage to continue because we fall in love with these women and yeah. these families. And the truth is that I'll, you know, I may, a volunteer may come in and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll tell some of the stories of the conversations. Well, someone said, yes, I know it's murder. I have to kill my baby. Well, how do you, where do you go from there? And you just, you just listen and you just keep saying why, and they keep talking. And then, and then you finally, it's like peeling away that onion. But I look at every single woman and say, you're beautiful. Yeah. You're beautiful. Yeah. And I, and, and that's just the grace of God. I was going to say, you were given the ability to see that through the grace. And we can all have that if we turn to God and, and ask for that because we're called to love. And that love that we're called to do is a gift of God. It isn't just us. But let's, exactly. let's pause here, let's take a break and we'll come back and continue our conversation. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Marie Joseph. She's uh, author and speaker. If you want to find out about her writings and her speaking, you can go to fireduppcatholics.com, right? Uh, but also we're going to talk about this uh, Legacy of Life Foundation a little bit. But before we get to that, I had some question as you were telling your story across my mind is that there's an awful lot of not just Catholics, but of other Christians that feel experientially like divorce is the unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. Uh, they can sometimes feel like, boy, I could, I could have done almost anything else and go in the confessional and move on free, but divorce is, is tough, you know, and they can feel the lack of community, lack of support, rejection. I think you experienced that. How do, how, how, talk about that, but also how do we make the community more more receptive of those whose lives have fallen apart through divorce. Right, and you feel like an outsider and you know that everybody, that's the big sin. And maybe today it's its the unplanned pregnancy. I mean, yeah. it's the things and see everybody can wear their sins and cover them up, but that one you can't, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you go to the church, it's a reminder when you see all these big happy families together and then, you know, and then you're there by yourself or with two little children. And, uh, and I would say number one would be to help people understand the truth that the sin is not divorce. You know, the sin is what we do with our bodies and, and you know, yep. uh, the infidelities that we, you know, or the, the, you know, that's the, that's the sin, right? So, or committing adultery, yep. but the sin is not divorce. So it doesn't mean that you can't be a part of the, the congregation right. and, uh, but it's how you're looked at, it's how you're, so the church can do a better job of reaching out and we definitely need more grassroots, especially in the Catholic Church, grassroots approaches to, to meeting people where they're at first and foremost and then teaching them why some of the, the you know, teachings are about the Eucharist and everything. Because once you understand why, then, then it makes a big difference. And sometimes we look at our lives and think, I think people are staying outside of the church because they think for, for me to be welcome and me to be entering and be union again, so much would have to change. There's no way, there's no way that we would be able to change this. But God, I've seen, I've seen miracles about what God does 
does in lives and even with my own just just going I, I went and had it and all got the annulment and you know I've been living single all these years it's been 18 years now it's been more than that actually and I've never, never thought I could have this kind of love and uh, in, in a single life. And that's what God has called me to. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not a couple of years, but that's what he's called me to. And some people don't think they could possibly live that way. But if you're receiving the sacraments and you're in union and community, all things are possible and, and it works. So, so churches has to do a better job of just small grassroots welcoming to, uh, you know, groups in the church. Yeah, moving on. You know, trying to figure out what I want to do. Um, you know, what do I, what should I be doing? The answer to any of those questions really begins with whatever it is. I want to do what God wants me to do. We have to get to that point. Exactly. Whether it's to be remarried mm -hmm. or to have a family, it really got to get to that point that before I answer any of those questions, mm -hmm. somehow by grace, I got to get to. I want to do what God wants me to do. Exactly, and if you really believe that God has that kind of power, so it's really ask God for more faith, because if you really believe that, then you believe that you don't have to make anything happen. You go where he calls you to go, and if he really wants you to meet somebody, they end up doing a delivery at your house. <laughs> and you, I mean, you really, I mean, you have to do some work, you know that, and, and minister stuff, but you really can follow God that way, and that's the ultimate trust in the Lord's will for you. And uh, that takes cultivating the relationship with Jesus Christ, that takes just saying yes every day, no matter what you're going through, and it takes offering as a prayer, whatever comes your way that isn't fun, that's a little painful and suffering. Um, my mom just, my mother is one of the first people I prayed for her conversion when I came back. That was the first big prayer that the Lord answered, <laughs> was that uh, she wasn't, she had, she was gonna have breast cancer, and she was, she wasn't, she didn't have it, and it was like a, it, amazing. Um, and she ended up passing on to eternal life in this past May, and she uh, had breast cancer in the bones, mm -hmm. and, uh, but her faith was so beautiful that it ended up being this incredible spiritual experience uh -huh. for me. So there's nothing that you're gonna go through that if you, if you surrender to God, that you, he won't bring you through and show you what he wants you to do next. You've been a Catholic 18 years or so? Yes. Okay, and uh, we're gonna talk a bit about your, your uh, 30 day spiritual cleansing mm -hmm. in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Before I wanna get to that, I wanna ask you one other question. In 18 years as a Catholic returned Catholic, you do a lot of pro-life work, you probably work with a lot of non-Catholic Christians too, mm -hmm. side by side. In your 18 year reflection, uh, why would you say it's important to be a Catholic? What's the Catholic side of it that is particularly important for you? That's a great question and I have so many close friends and family members that left the Catholic Church and that are in other beautiful you know, churches. The most important thing that I've received is the experience of grace. And it's, it's a strength. It's a strength, it's a, it's, a, it's a knowledge of God in such a powerful way that uh, I love scripture, the word of God immediately by yeah. the power of the Holy Spirit became my, my life just, I mean, I was trying to get everybody to change their life and read the book and, and it's Jesus, not just the book. And, and people couldn't believe I was living my life according to the book, that's just a book of it's Jesus. But in the sacraments, and I see it even in the work we do with the staff, everybody has to be able to go to the sacraments for their strength to receive the mercy from confession, to receive the healing from the anointing of the sick, uh, to, heal, to receive the Eucharist on a regular base, basis. There's a powerful, and maybe it's because that's how I came, came back in, but the experience I had, I, I couldn't trade that for anything in the world. And that's, that's what I want for my Christian brothers and sisters that I love so much, that are Bible believing, and they know how to praise the Lord, and I praise with them and sing with them, and we love Jesus together, and we pray for each other and um, that's that's the only thing I want for them is I want them to have that same kind of strength and, and, and grace from the sacraments. Fullness. Mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about fullness. the fullness, the fullness mm -hmm. with the, the sacraments and the grace and as our Lord said apart from me you can do nothing okay well 
uh, well, how do I get united with him? Well, he says, eat my body and drink my blood, the uniqueness of that Eucharistic gift that we have. Exactly, and you know, the priesthood, the priesthood. I mean, like I said, when my mother was dying, just to have the priesthood there, the priests, the priests are fathers. They've been fathers for me. The community of the Catholic Church, uh, sisters, nuns have been advisors and, and, and prayed for me, and deacons, and, uh, and that whole ministry of the priesthood gave me so much comfort and grace and knowing that my mother was on the journey home, the home, not the show, but the home, <laughs> um, to go see the Lord and the saints. I remember my mother loved St. Therese and, and there was all these um, confirmations that the Blessed Mother and the saints, you just you just know and you feel that when you have the relationship with them. And that's, that's something that is so special that I wish my brothers and sisters in Christ would also know. All right, well, our guest is Marie Joseph. All right, 30-day spiritual cleanse. How'd that idea come about for you? So after I graduated from the seminary, I felt like at the end, and, and I've, I've taken, you know, I said I, I had a business major and everything, when, but having the theology major, and at the end you have to take the what they call the comps, right? Anybody? Yeah. So the comps is a comprehensive exam of all the years, and I had studied for seven years because I was going at night at St. Charles Bartmeo <laughs> Seminary, and when I studied for those comps, which I had for months, but in those especially last days, I said, oh, it's Jesus. Everything we had learned, the theology of the Eucharist, theology of grace, theology of, of uh, worship, it all came down to it was Jesus so powerfully that I wanted to write it down because, again, my passion is about evangelization, especially for people who don't know the faith. So, but at the same time, I was doing this nutritional cleanse and I was learning about the body and how to get healthy and I had been struggling. And so what I was learning was that if you feed the body with all this nutrition and then you cleanse it uh, and you take a fast day once in a while, um, how the cells get rejuvenated and, and healthier. And, um, and so I, and we had to do it over 30 days. And I said, you know, I'm gonna take what I was learning nutritionally and what I learned from the seminary and do the first half of the book a crash course in the Catholic faith, how you could practice your Catholic faith. And then the second half, a 30-day cleanse, which was really just taking, again, my business background and saying, well, we know how to plan for things. We know how to have a planner on our desk. So what if, and, and also the idea that as a community, you could do this together. So have, you know, for 30 days, I'm gonna do this. First pray, what does God want me to, to know or do to get closer to him? and then. What are the different parts of, of the faith that I might, maybe the Bible, maybe, maybe you know, going to mass, maybe going to confess. And you write down, you make a plan for yourself for 30 days. And the idea is to cultivate really good habits and then have somebody else become accountable so that every day you're doing this, but then you're also accountable to somebody else. And, you know, I wrote this and had so many people write a book and then that's great and everything. I did it in that year before I had gotten my, the job with the, with the Women's Center, with the Christ Pregnancy Center. So I was speaking. And I was feeling I was meeting so many Catholics who who, who aren't praying enough. They're, they're doing the actions in the church, but they're not spending enough time with the Lord. And so I, I did this. And then I had a spiritual director and, he, you know, he said, why don't you do your book? Why don't you do your 30 day cleanse for your for your for your penance? I said, OK. So I did the 30 days more intensely than I ever had after I'd written the book. And I said, this is really a great book. This is great. <laughs> My confession when I went to confession, because part of it is you you document your, your sinfulness. You know, every day there's a place to write down, where did I miss the mark? And then on Saturday, going to confession, I had it all here. It was fresh. It was clear. <laughs> and then I, I felt a new remorse, a new sadness for my sinfulness, and then a new joy when I brought it to the Lord. And so, uh, so this book was intended for people to practice our faith. I blogged uh, all the gospels of the Bible, of the, uh, you know, the four gospels. I was doing a blog. This is all before I started the, the work. And then when I started the work, I decided to give the proceeds of this book to the Legacy of Life Foundation mm -hmm. to have a new life in Christ support new life, you know, from women who have chosen life instead of abortion. It's interesting when it comes to my mind when you're talking about this, that if you, if you take a piece of paper and throw metal filings on the paper, they can just be random and and a globular, but if you put a magnet underneath it, all of a sudden those filings kind of shift and come in order. Mm. And, and it sounds like that's what it is, our lives are a mess, and by grace, 
and cooperating with grace, pretty soon it can bring your life into order in line with Christ. Exactly, and it ha it's always the order that we didn't think we could ever have. It's mm -hmm. always, see, when we, we don't take that first step because we think that'll never happen. Just like we say, that person will never change. That person will never transform. And then, you know, you do something like this for 30 days and you're doing things you've never done before and you're following some order and you get the grace to do it. And now that becomes a habit that you can do, you know, that you can, you know, can go on and on and on. And people end up changing and they end up praying in ways that they never have before. So it's a kind of an introduction and then a, a workbook that somebody could follow. And I found that people, when I started this, prayer groups were doing it together, people would maybe have me come speak, introduce the book, and then they would go and do it together. And it's the same way that you start an exercise program. You maybe ask somebody else to walk with you every morning so that you make sure you walk. And you say, I want to walk four times a week. Okay, then let's do it. And you hold each other accountable. When you don't really feel like doing it, the other person helps you to do it. All right. If someone wants to find out more about that book, where should they go? This book is on www.firedupcatholics.com. All right. And again, they can order it right on the internet, and the, the proceeds will go then. Uh, I'll make a donation sure. to the Legacy Life Foundation. Very good. All right. We have an email. Paul from Hartford writes, how does Marie think her devotion and love of the Catholic Church is different now than if she had never left the Catholic Church in the first place? Wow, great question. So if I had, I, I think about that a lot because I'm, there's no way I'm the same person that I was back then. I think that I would still be in the church had I not re-entered. I believe I would still have been um, a Christmas and Easter <laughs> Catholic, somebody who still came once in a while and was feeling like I was on the outside still, not understanding. And I would have been walking around with a lot of the past hurts, the effects of the hurts, uh, and some of the things that I was carrying that the Lord, the encounter with Jesus Christ freed me from a lot of things that I would not be the same. I would not be joyful. I would not be the same person. I can't imagine what that would look like, but, but <laughs> well, God again deals Amen. with every one of us a little differently. Amen. And there are some people who have given the grace from the time they were very, very young to be strong in their faith all their lives to grow in a continuous journey. Some of us need to have it taken away from us for a while to appreciate what we had in the first place. Right. right, and I thank God every day for for the things that I went through, and I'm grateful for the people who didn't have to go through them too. Yeah. And that's what I hope for my children as well, that they can uh, continue on without having to go through that. All right, we have another email. Preston from Virginia Beach writes, how can we as Catholic uh, better engage people about Catholicism and not be afraid to share our faith with those in our lives, even when it involves tough issues like the sanctity of life and moral issues that are unpopular to talk about. Another excellent question. So I would say, and I talk to people a lot about, because we deal with people who are sharing their sinfulness, right, yeah. is that as a Catholic, we shouldn't lead with the teachings, the moral teachings of the church. We should lead with the love and the mercy of God. But if we haven't really encountered that in our life, then we're holding fast to, to teachings that, are, that, that then turn people away right away. It doesn't open a dialogue. So, so what I have found is to enter into, find out who people are. You know, listen to people and, and let them feel that you're somebody that even though you're Catholic, they could tell you, look, I'm divorced and I'm living with this guy right now. And you know what? I love him. And you know what? The church shouldn't do, you know, say that I can't receive the Eucharist, blah, blah, blah. You know, no, like, I love you. Tell me, tell me more about that. You know, what, you know, what do you like about that relationship? And then in time, people start saying, you know what I'm seeing in you? I'm seeing the love of Jesus and I feel better and I want to be a better person and I want to pray. I haven't been praying, but since I've been talking to you now, I want to pray. And that's what, that's kind of how, that's how I've been able to, I know through God's grace and, and a lot of the people that I work with, we've been able to, and it's not fake, it's real. I love these people, you know, and so show that love. I don't want to ask a personal 
question to this, but to a certain extent, did your own experience with your husband also lead to sensitivity in that issue? When I first came back to the church, because I, I loved him so much, I still yeah. do, and uh, when I first came back to the church and I was so on fire, that was the one thing that I was holding on to. And every time I'd be in a prayer meeting or I'd be at church and someone stood up and so many Catholics feel this way about whatever issue that's holding them back. And you hear them saying, you know, homosexuality is wrong. And I'm like, ooh, that hurts because you see, we're still trying to have family and even though it's broken right now, we're still gonna get together on the holidays. And so how do I love him? And that's the key. How do I love the sinner? and hate the sin by God's grace only. And so uh, once again, I was able to repent, go to the Lord on that. Uh, he started to show me how to love him, have the children praying for him and how to have a relationship with him. That doesn't mean that I'm you know, condoning the sin and the sin is really hurting him. And so we pray for his conversion forever, pray for him to receive the love and mercy and that God would bless him and that he would come back to the Catholic church. All right, well, that's it definitely a prayer that all of us need to pray for all the people in our lives that we wish would come closer mm -hmm. to Christ and conversion and uh, and which you know John says at the end of his uh, gospel that uh, if you put down everything Jesus said <laughs> we wouldn't have enough books so that meant that the Holy Spirit guided the, the early writers to select important things that Jesus said that probably had very important impact on the people of the early church. And one of those things that Jesus said that the early church, early writers recognized, yeah, this has got to be in every gospel, mm -hmm. is that thing about uh, take the log out of your own eye before you mm -hmm. take the sliver out of somebody else's. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so important. And, and going one-on-one -on -one and listening to somebody in their, in their sinfulness and, 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 and talking to them about where they're at and loving them and, and, and yeah. being, being Christ to them doesn't mean that you're less Catholic or that now you don't believe that you know, premarital sex is wrong and, and that you're, you're, you're reaching out because the bigger the sin, the more the potential for mercy. And so reaching out and seeing that as a beautiful uh, chance for God's grace to flow through you to somebody else, uh, that's, that's the beauty of what God's calling us to do in the new evangelization. The, the first thing in having influence is the little word in. Mm -hmm. Influence begins with mm -hmm. in. You can't have influence unless you're in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So you got to be able to get in the relationship if you want to have, for, for grace of God, influence. Exactly. And I'm yeah. seeing, as I said, in the star, in the star program with the women, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing transformation take place because of experiences they have, whether we're, uh, we're in the house learning how to cook, doing a cooking session, or they're learning how to paint and realizing that they have skills and they have creativity, all God-given gifts. You know, they start coming alive and people can change. Some people believe, well, that person will never change. That's the life they're living. They took a wrong turn and, and that's it. And uh, it doesn't mean that they're, you know, that you may have to change the way that relationship plays out, but to break ties with people just because of yeah. because of their sinfulness is uh, is really doing a disservice to the service of Christ. And uh, we see that every day that people can change and they want to change. Yeah. They just need that that love and mercy. God can work through us. Right. Amen. Uh, okay. Uh, email Carol from Omaha writes: My niece had a pain-filled experience with a family member. Uh, who is now estranged from her. She has subsequently drifted far from the faith and appears angry with God. I'm fairly certain that she still struggles with reconciling that suffering with understanding God's love and care for her. How can I reach her and assure her that God uh, truly is a loving father who wants the best for his children? So I would say with, with anybody who's feeling that way and who's estranged in some way, that step number one is what can we do to have common ground with that person individually? So, so maybe it's um, cooking for them or maybe it's, t it's just 
talking to them about something that they want to talk about mm -hmm. and not feeling like we feel like we have to go all the way to the teachings of John Paul II, let's say, with somebody who's <laughs> away. I mean, it's going to be a journey. And so first, it's, it's always about finding out what is going on in their life. And maybe you have to pick up bowling if that's what they like to do, or you have to learn football like I've, I have with my son and, and cook <laughs> for football games, you know, because, because whatever we can do to be in dialogue and have open communication, just us first. Forget about the whole big church. Right now, we're church. And for many people who are very passionate about their Catholic faith, you become I don't want to say a God in charge for people because that's the only experience that they're going to have. And so you want to make it a good one, but you can't do that unless you find out personally what, what makes them tick right now, what makes them happy, and try to be there. And then the dialogue starts to begin. Yeah, that was, it's at the core of that Catholic idea of offering it up. Mm -hmm. You know, this, and maybe the one thing that, that maybe a majority of people need to offer up mm -hmm. is inconvenience. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, to, to reach out to someone, well, that's not convenient for me. No, that's got to be left up mm -hmm. so that we can be a channel of love to that person. Yeah, we're just too busy. We're just too busy. How many times, when, and then this book definitely talks about your daily, when you look at the daily plan, who did I share Christ with today? And uh, when you offer things up like that, then God just puts people in your path. Marie, thank you. Great to see you. Good. Thank, you. thank you for joining us again. And again, the website is firedupcatholics.com uh, where they can connect with you. So thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. Once again, I hope that Marie Joseph's story, as well as the things she's talked about uh, in her book and in her work, is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week.